What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. This is Marty Bent. It's been about two weeks since we last saw each other. Uh, sorry for the week hiatus. It took me a little bit, get a little bit of time to get somebody in the studio, and I'm very excited for this series of episodes because we had a great guest. His name is Pierre Rochard, co-founder of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, uh, the Nakamoto Institute dot org. We had a great three and a half hour long conversation last Friday night here in New York City, uh, spanning a, a litany of topics, uh, including economic theory, uh, the pol politi politics of hard forks, how Bitcoin works, Bitcoin versus Ethereum, cold storage, and a bunch of other topics I'm sure uh, you freaks are interested in. Due to uh, the length of the conversation we had, I'm going to cut down these episodes into three parts. Um, so here is the first part. I hope you guys enjoy. From the crypt. What is up, freaks? Welcome to Tales from the Crypt. This is your host, Marty Bent. We've made it to episode two. If you missed out on uh, the first couple parts of episode one, we covered the history of Bitcoin, myself and Lewis Roberts of Barstool. Um, today, Lewis cannot be with us in the studio, but I have a very special guest for you all. Before I introduce my guest, I have some good news for everybody. I think we've officially made it. We sold our first ad this week. The first ad in Tales from the Crypt history. And here we go. This is my first ever ad read, so bear with me. We've got our buddy Graham Annette. He's looking for a software engineer position. He's previously worked as a, as a developer and a data scientist specializing in Python Node.js, and I believe he's done some SQL as well. He's uh, based out of Seattle, looking for a job right now between positions, um, but he's willing to work remote. He's worked remote for a company in New York before, so you can get that East Coast, West Coast time zone blend. If you're looking for a remote developer, I need you to hit my boy Graham Annette up. <laughs> you can find him at new season of curb is mediocre.ga. That is new season of curb is mediocre.ga. You can also go to Graham's personal website, which is grahamannette.me. That's grahamannette.me. G R A H A M A N N E T T dot M E. Graham Annette. Highly skilled developer, engineer, highly recommended by Marty. So if you're looking to hire, hit my boy up. felt good first ad read and may i uh may i say an ad read paid for with bitcoin at a discount i think i think the discount really really caught graham's eye and he had to go for it um, but that's enough of the ads let's roll right into the interview today i have with us pierre rochard for those of you that don't know pierre is a software engineer investor and entrepreneur he considers excuse me he considers himself a bitcoin maximalist and minimalist hmm. he's actually Writing some code for the Bitcoin Core, not team. Ecosystem. I don't want to say ecosystem. Yes, um, and he is the co-founder of one of my favorite resources in the in the realm of Bitcoin, and that is the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. Um, so, for those of you that have read any of the the popular papers out there, uh, hyper Bitcoinization. Um, Problem with altcoins is a very important one. Uh, and then speculative attack is also, I think, uh, you know, that's self-promotional because I wrote that one. But those two other ones you mentioned are from uh, our, our research director, Daniel Krawitz. Daniel Krawitz, yes. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump right into it, I guess. That's sort of how I found you was mm -hmm. this Nakamoto Institute, read your papers years ago. Uh, like many, uh, yeah. they're, they're something you've, you've read it four years ago and then you come back to them again today and it's like, wow, what you wrote is still – prescient and still relevant and it's still happening um yeah that's, that's a relief for me i i i couldn't tell the future at the time <laughs> i was just trolling uh but uh yeah so i i think that the reason that those papers those those i mean blog posts let's call them what they are uh withstood the test of time is kind of my economics background um i started getting into economics when I was a junior in high school. 
uh, I discovered the Austrian School of Economics, which is kind of a free market approach to uh, the economy. And uh, it's particularly what captured my attention was monetary policy. So what is money? How does it interact with the economy? Uh, how does it interact with economic growth, booms and busts, bubbles, manias, uh, the credit system, the stock market? So all of this was fascinating to me. Um, don't know why I was probably born that way. Uh, and in the world of Austrian economics, they're very much at odds with the way the current system is set up. So the current system is central banks operated by a government uh, that essentially you know, create money out of thin air and lend it out through banks. And these banks operate on you know, what's called a fractional reserve banking model. Uh, and the accusation from the Austrian School of Economics is that that causes these large macroeconomic booms and busts. And the way to fix that is that you get rid of the central bank, you make the money not, you know, you make it scarce. You don't make it so that someone can arbitrarily create more. So in the old model, that was gold. In the new model, that's Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with in terms of the, uh, the, the payments and credit system, you have it so that uh, it's what's called 100% reserve, uh, which is that you can't create, um, and it kind of goes back to, yeah, creating money out of thin air. You, you can't just, uh, what I would call counterfeit, you know, counterfeit money and lend it out. And uh, so, yeah, so I was, I was discovering this in high school. I was thinking about it all through college, uh, debating this. We, so this is how I met Michael Goldstein and Daniel Krawitz. Did you guys meet at Texas? We met at Texas, Hook'em, uh, and Dale Horns. We were we were not we were not uh, at the football game, you know, drinking beers and talking <laughs> economics. Uh, we were we're not that cool. We were we started a meetup called the Mesa Circle, where we would all uh, go to a classroom and nerd out about <laughs> all these things I've been talking about. What uh, what year is this? This is uh, 2012. 2012. Yeah. So uh, we're we're t so within the Austrian school, there's a debate between those who are for 100% reserve banking and those who are for fractional reserve banking. They're called free bankers. And uh, you know we had some of both in our Mises circles. So we were debating these ideas, and uh, one of our members, Daniel Krawitz, was already into Bitcoin, but. I kind of uh, he 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 played it close to the vest. We didn't find out that he was into Bitcoin until uh, probably like I, f I feel like it was like October, November of 2012 when he brought it up. It was, it was his little secret for a few months. He was keeping it from the Mises group. You know, I don't even know when he originally bought in or got into it. Maybe maybe it's best that that's left a mystery so that uh you know You'd, we provide we protect his privacy. Bitcoin is filled with mysteries. We've yes. been talking about this the first few yes. episodes. There's a uh, lot of mysteries, a lot of unresolved yes. A lot of unresolved conflict. And that's something uh that's sort of cool to bring up because you and Daniel yeah. you started this group, you started Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. Yeah. But then you guys differ on some points too. Yeah, for sure. So. Um so well yeah, so I mean he he brought up Bitcoin. I I didn't know anything about Bitcoin, although I'd heard about it before obviously because it had been in the news with Silk Road and whatnot. Um but once he explained to me what Bitcoin's monetary policy is, uh it just was instantly something that I knew was going to revolutionize the world of money and that it had the perfect monetary policy based on all of the years I'd spent thinking about the issue of monetary policy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so when we think about, you know, from that to today and, um, yeah, so the, the current debate is about the block size limit. I think that's kind of like... The, the scaling of Bitcoin is the hot button issue that everyone in Bitcoin is talking about. And uh, Daniel and I do diverge on it. He is in favor of larger blocks. Uh, I, th I think that he's in favor of not having a block size limit at all. Uh, his point of view 
has merit. It's not baseless. Um, but uh, I, I do fundamentally disagree with it. And I think part of the disagreement, not just with Daniel, but with uh, everyone who is for big block size, uh, is that we have a different uh, philosophical view of what Bitcoin's all about. Hmm. And yeah. I think at this point, it's a uh, good point to take a step back yeah. and uh, sort of let's describe how Bitcoin works yeah. as a technology and how the system works, the nodes, the miners, the right. users, developers, and where does where does the block size come into play within how, yeah. how Bitcoin works? So if we go back to the white paper, uh, it some some particular sentences don't really withstand the test of time. Uh, in particular, when it comes to mining. So there's kind of a notion in the white paper that uh, everyone has a computer, right? And this is like 2008. So, yeah, everyone has a computer. Everyone has a CPU in their computer, a central processing unit. So that's that's your Intel Pentium 4 was probably what we were on <laughs> back then. Um, or today, your i5, your i7. Anyway, the idea was that you mining on your computer provide a vote on what is Bitcoin. Uh, now, there, there's a bunch of other things involved, but fundamentally, that's if we analogize to democracy, which I'm very hesitant to do because there's uh, so much, uh, so many complications that the analogy quickly falls apart. But, uh, you know, there is a notion of one CPU, one vote, one computer, one vote. Uh, this, uh, this diverged uh, when we started getting into other forms of mining, uh, which is basically using specialized hardware to mine. And then you had a, a centralization that started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you guys listened to the first couple of episodes, we sort of explained, uh, when was it? GPU miners mm -hmm. came on the scene. I believe it was summer of 2010 or 11. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. So... The way Bitcoin set up originally, it allowed for a, a mining race, a chip race, basically. Yeah. People, people to race to create chips that could mine faster, and this led to, I guess, could you say it led to centralization in the way of it became harder for people to access that hardware to run, so fewer people could right. run well, it or were capable to run it, so it becomes sort of a, a smaller circle of people that can use it right so like if we really get into the nuts and bolts of it we, we had graphics cards so we start with cpus then we have graphics cards and then we had what's called fpgas uh, which is basically a, a processor that you can reprogram so it's not it's not hard-coded at the factory uh, and then we had asics which are hard-coded at the factory so that means you've got to have a relationship with a semiconductor manufacturer, and these factories, they are massive capital outlays. We're talking billions of dollars with a B. So uh, that means that if you have a relationship with the biggest semiconductor manufacturer, and it's called TSMC in Taiwan, uh, then you can control the market for ASICs, for Bitcoin ASICs. Uh, and I believe that's what uh, we've seen happen with Bitmain. Now, granted, it's not a monopoly. Like there are other players out there, and they are competing, um, but uh, it has become centralized in terms of who is pumping out these chips. And then, uh, so that's on the hardware side. And then, if we kind of look on the um, operational side, the electricity costs apparently are lower in China, and so that's led to geographic concentration of these data centers that have all these ASIC chips mining away uh, in different nooks and crannies of China, where apparently, for to believe, they have subsidized electricity, uh, and yeah. that that you, makes them hyper-competitive. You never know. You never know with China. I, I worked at the futures markets for yeah. two years, not too long. I'm not an expert by any means, but from what I could gather... In the industry, nobody trusts data coming out of China really too well, and they're always very mysterious with what they're doing, especially yeah. around Bitcoin. I, I've read stories of like hedge fund managers looking at satellite data so that they can get a better idea 
rather than what, trusting the official number. So it's a, it's an interesting. It would not surprise me. I mean, I've seen I've seen the documentaries. I'm sure many of you have. They've been out on Vice of the ghost towns. They make yeah. just replica cities that are. Flip side to that is I've I've seen people say, yeah, well, those ghost towns are filled now. Really? So yeah. So what? What you know? And uh, so it's just things are changing. It's a very dynamic society in some respects. So it's very hard to uh, pin down exactly what what's going on over there, what's going right, what's going wrong. Um, but what, as an outsider. But what we do know is that mining has been centralized yes. to a point in China. Right. And so politically, and there are politics in Bitcoin. Uh, politically, it has led to some pushback. And I think the major form of that pushback is that we have to balance. So, OK, let's go back to the white paper. In the white paper, he does say, you know, one CPU, one vote. And well, OK, he doesn't say that specifically, but he does mention CPU. And he does make it look like basically every Bitcoin node is mining. And this centralization is such that a infinitesimal sliver of nodes are mining. Maybe let's call it 12, uh, a dozen nodes are mining. Uh, and so in the white paper, he says th that as long as 51% of the mining hash power is controlled by honest nodes, then we're okay. The problem is that he provides no definition for what honest is. Mm -hmm. So any anything we read into that is kind of like, you know, when we're reading the Constitution and trying to figure out the founder's intent or trying to, you know, update it or modernize it or, you know, there's just there's just no answer there. Yeah, so And it seems like a lot of the two, the people pushing the 2x hard fork are sort of relying on these semantics of the mm -hmm. white paper and sort of... that That's right. They go back to Satoshi's vision. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, they... I, I would argue that the big blockers are the equivalent of originalists in a constitutional law who are trying to figure out the founder's intent. Uh, and uh, I, I think that from an intellectual point of view, that's kind of silly. Like, we should try to figure this out and not just fall back on an argument from authority. Um, but the, the counterpoint to that is that, look, Satoshi is the guy who got this to work. So maybe we should take what he says pretty seriously. Uh, there, there might be some wisdom we can get from there. Um, but uh, so, yeah, the, the majority of hash power being controlled by honest nodes. And the, the political dynamic now is that uh, we, we, the Bitcoin, let's call it the community, Bitcoin <laughs> space, the uh, See. whatever stupid word we want to throw out there, uh, have have decided that the definition of honest is in our collective hands, and that if my node, if my node thinks that your mining node is dishonest, you don't get to push me around and overrule me, and we we are equals on the network, and you are free to fork yourself off and take your node and your miners outside of the network, but the rest of us are going to just keep Bitcoining. We're going to keep using the consensus rules yeah. laid out by Bitcoin Core. Yeah, and we will attract new miners. We we hired the miners. We'll hire different miners and, if you're not going to be a part of a consensus. And so we just got on a very technical rant there Yeah, <laughs> to a point. I'm sorry, freaks, but we're, we're going to yeah, break it we, down here. So We blasted you in the first like 10 minutes. <laughs> we, we just came out hot. All yeah. right, we're gonna cool it down a little bit now. Cool our jets. Um, so that's sort of I touched on it in the first couple episodes. We're going through a huge debate in the Bitcoin space right now, which revolves around the block size. And if I can describe this, if I were to, if I am going to describe this to to you listeners, this is how I would describe it. Basically, when Bitcoin was really young, uh, there was. Was there was there no initial? There was there was no block there was size no block limit. size limit. Yeah, at the very beginning. But at the very beginning, when the network was small, like I said, it was weak and feeble at the beginning. It grew to be anti fragile. Uh, it was very susceptible to DDoS attacks, people basically spam attacks. People, governments or entities could easily attack the Bitcoin network um, because of unlimited blocks and because of this Satoshi. I you know I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put your feet to the fire there. Actually, uh, I don't know that. There, I think this was a theoretical problem. 
if if I recall correctly, because there, I I don't think. Th- there's I don't think that there's ever been a block that was like one megabyte like back then, you know, that yeah. like someone actually tried to push it. I think that he was kind of thinking like on a on a worst case scenario basis, but I I'm probably not the best person to ask on this, but I do think that there was to to an extent it was just like, "Oh, I'm throwing this in here just in case." And Which, exactly. So yeah, at the end of the day, anyway, yeah. S- s- I'm not positive either. <laughs> I, uh, I believe you know more than I at this point. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, Satoshi put this limit in. Yeah. And now that Bitcoin has grown up, it has hit. It hasn't hit the threshold yet. There was, there's a good argument that it was spammed. Um, yeah. And it, it's still not there. And I, I think that during some periods of the day, so like when, like today, you know, fantastic trading day today, gentlemen uh, and ladies. Uh, Days like today, people are moving a lot of bitcoins around. They're buying, they're selling, they're going, they're arbitraging, uh, and so you can have peak hours where the blocks are full, and arguably there's no spam in them. Uh, so I would I would say that at specific peak hours we are hitting the limit. But in ge- generally speaking, uh, if you set your target out like 24, 48 hours. Uh, you you can pay you know a de minimis fee, uh, and so on a wider time scale we don't have full blocks. Yes, exactly. And there's a segment of again community is a very hmm. not a very good term, but people that use I still like to say people that use Bitcoin. Yeah, there's yeah. a segment of people that use Bitcoin that think we need to basically double the block size to yeah. to basically plant or take on this this volume of of use that's about to come with the next wave of of users yeah. that come in but and, and to do it in a way that existing services don't need to like rethink how they're transacting and just kind of keep it's it's a very, it's actually a very conservative argument of hey let's just uh, keep doing what we've been doing and keep increasing the block size limit yeah, and I'm I'm a big fan of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And yeah, going back yeah. to I, me personally, I'm yeah. a hodler, so I don't I don't care about fees right now. I haven't, right. I haven't moved Bitcoin right. or anything, and I don't care. I mean, whenever I buy Bitcoin and move it to another wallet, it gets yeah. there in a in a in a timely matter at a at a fee I'm willing to pay. Right. Um, but again, that is a. Uh, that is what we're finding out with this weird technology. That's what blows my mind about this space because it's something so new and so raw. We, we're we still figuring out how it works and how the game theory plays out between the, yeah. the actors in the system and how how we're actually going to use this this technology going forward. I mean, you look at the space now, we have the ICOs, we have altcoins, we have Ethereum, mm. obviously, and that whole scene. And yeah. we're still figuring out what exactly we can do with this technology. You... Uh, myself, I, w- I will add, would argue that a lot of these altcoins are pointless. Um, yeah. Not pointless, but... Uh, misguided. Misguided. Perhaps, for the most part. <laughs> um, S- some so- are outright, uh, like, frauds or outright, you know, just money grabs. So let's let's go on to the money grab of the week, what everybody's been talking about, Tezos. Oh, man. $232 million, and... And now it's worth like four hundred million. Plus oh, yes, because yes. of the price going up. And they sold Ethereum at the like that the U.S. dollar bottom this summer. Um, but that's this is a prime example of for me. Again, I like to take a, yeah. a a conservative approach. Keep it simple, stupid. I think we're still trying to figure out how to make Bitcoin work. We um, are. That's absolutely true. And. I think people going out trying to start the world computer and create like yeah. I'm all for innovation, I'm all for experiment experimenting, but yeah. I don't know. I go back and forth. I go back and forth. But Tezos is a perfect example of this. They literally marketed themselves as a project that was going to solve the governance problem. Yeah. So actually, uh, I was I was reading. I was trying to figure out like yeah. Go ahead. Just bring my closer. Yeah. Um, so their 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 approach to governance is kind of that um, you can vote on proposals and amend the consensus on the fly without doing kind of a hard fork. Um, and I was thinking about how that contrasts with Bitcoin's governance, 
And what is the word we use for Bitcoin's governance? You know, it's a network. It's a distributed network. There's got to be a word. So I was, I was searching on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the word is network governance. <laughs> so, I saw that tweet today. Were yeah, you... uh, that, that kind of blew my mind. Like, I, I've been in Bitcoin for years now. I, I'd never even seen the phrase before. And frankly, it is a perfect description of Bitcoin's governance in that, look, uh, it's not a democracy. It's not a dictatorship. It's not a technocracy, which is like when the experts are in charge. Uh, it's a distributed network, and it, it just is. It just is, and you, you you basically you know in in law they call it a meeting of the minds, and I really like that that figure of speech because humans live in a social context, and things kind of exist based on our agreement that they exist and that they are that way. And it's that way with property, it's that way with family, it's that way with society, and it is that way with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is Bitcoin based on where our minds meet and we agree on something, which is that Bitcoin is Bitcoin, not Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> it is not Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> but for for some of you, yeah. I know I know a lot of my listeners out there are are newer. To, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. Bitcoin.com is not indicative of Bitcoin at all. Let me just make that clear. It is, what do you a call it, a marketing? Website. A trash website. Yeah. Run by a disgruntled early adopter. Yeah, yeah. A former Bitcoiner. <laughs> it's now an altcoiner. Now an altcoiner. That is true. Running around with the fake Satoshi. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, but let's get back to Tezos, because I yeah. think that um, it's an interesting cautionary tale for people who are new into this space, because... You're going to be promised a lot of things. People are going to promise you that they have the next best thing, that uh, it's a fantastic investment opportunity, they have the best technology, they have the most innovation, etc. Um, Tezos, if you bought, calling them Tezies, I don't know how they came oh, up with that name. The cheesiest I, name, I, Ike. I, I, Could you imagine owning like something and like calling your money Tezzy? Yeah, and trying not to laugh. Like, <laughs> I think that and people people criticize Bitcoin's name. They're like, oh, there's there's too much focus on the money because it has coin in it. Like, Come on, man, it's money. Like, what? <laughs> it's I mean, the perfect name for it. It's digital money, Bitcoin. Like, it's genius. If, and if you break it down into Bitcoin, I think it like the etymology or not the etymology. What it, what it yeah, breaks down to yeah. is creating information or something right. like that, or information create. Yeah. Um, DeSantis blows that up, that that, <laughs> that nut. Um, so, yeah, you, you buy your tezzies, and uh, you, you think you're buying your tezzies, but you're actually making a donation. You're making a donation to the Tezos Foundation. That's the contract that you're entering into, is that you are making a non-refundable donation to a Swiss nonprofit, and that's that. And there's, there's no guarantee that tezzies will ever exist. In fact, they specifically say that the project may be abandoned. Okay, so like, and that that blows my mind. But and, yeah. And I think we have to say this. They originally shopped this idea around the banks, and right. they originally were trying to raise $5 million, and they couldn't even raise $5 million going the traditional route. Right. Um, and then they wound up raising $232 million Yes. via an ICO. I, I, I think that, well... There's kind of two things here. First of all, um, you know, uh, I, I love listening. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make, put in a, a plug for a different podcast. Which go for it. You know, it's probably bad form, but this week in startups with Jason Calacanis. Mm -hmm. uh, he is an angel investor. He is perhaps one of the most well known angel investors. He came out with a book about angel investing. Anyway. The point he makes is that if you're going to be an angel investor, you need to be in Silicon Valley because the best deals are in Silicon Valley. And if you're in New York, you're only going to see the leftovers, the things that everyone in Silicon Valley passed on. And so you're getting the bottom of the barrel in terms of deal flow. And obviously, that's true. Um, and so when you look at, okay, this project got shopped around, you know, everyone looked at it. The, the last resort is an ICO, right? Because at that point, you're like, all right, no, no professional investor is interested in this. Uh, no, no one who has domain knowledge, who has expertise. So I'm going to go to the retail public, and I'm going to hire 
a PR firm, and uh, I'm going to market this. And and so th- this goes the, to my second point, PR, which is yeah, the PR f- firm like lied to people too, didn't they? Yeah, I made some misleading statements. Yeah. Uh, Lie, yeah, it might have been some, uh, arguably- uh, An extended truth, we'll yeah, say Yeah, it. it was the massage of truth. Um, and so I think the second point, though, is that they did raise $200 million plus. And to me, that speaks to the incredible amount of, I, I don't know if we can even call it retail investment, because like clearly there are whales who are involved in this. Mm-hmm. Um but needless to say, I think that these people have uh, accumulated capital f- from owning Bitcoins, from owning Ethereum, and are interested in looking for the next big thing and deploying the crypto capital that they have accumulated. Uh, so I, I think that it's it's it shows the amount of wealth creation going on in crypto, broadly speaking. Uh, even if we say, hey, like there's a lot of paper gains, there's a lot of fake money, but uh, bottom line is uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of money flowing through the sector. <laughs> yeah, and Tim Draper was a big, big yeah, uh, so, Tezos cheerleader there. And he, yeah. and he, like we talked about him last episode, Freaks, he bought the first auction, uh, the first U.S. Marshals auction of the Silk Road coins, the first batch of 30,000 coins. He bought them all up. So it makes sense to me that Tim Draper, he's he's a VC, you know, like he is looking to invest in a hundred companies and have two of them be wildly successful. Uh, so for him, like, yeah, Tezos might not work out. That's fine. He's got a big diversified portfolio of big bets. Um, for your average punter on Twitter. Is looking for the next big thing, uh, they they're they're gonna go all in on one of these, and uh, they're gonna lose big. <laughs> they're, they're hunting Twitter for cash tags. Yeah, yeah. They're looking they're looking for the pump accounts with with uh, cartoon character faces. You don't yeah. know who it is. Uh, believe me, I got caught up in that in 2013, 2014. That whole alt, it's, it's alt hard hype. not to. It's a lot it, of fun. It really is, and that was actually yesterday. I watched an interview Krista Rose just did with. Um, I gotta forget her name, but she's a journalist at CoinDesk. She's an editor at CoinDesk now. Yeah, Bailey Rutzel, Bailey, I think. Yes, Bailey mm-hmm. Rutzel. Mm-hmm. And she was saying that it's funny because she covered Bitcoin early on in her career or early on in Bitcoin's yeah. life lifetime for a few years and took a break, a hiatus, yeah. and then came back. And she's like, It's 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 true detective. It's a flat circle. Like there's there's cycles that happen in the space. Yes. And it's funny for me. I think this is my third cycle. The second one, I was like, oh, I th- feel like this happening, and now yeah. I'm definitely like, okay, this is like, there's a theme here. Like you, right. you come into this space and you think, oh my god, Bitcoin's my space. Like these new altcoins, they got new, yeah. they got three mining algorithms working. They got their, right. they got their incentives figured out. It's going to be the next one. And well, par- part of what attracts us to Bitcoin in the first place is that it is highly innovative. It it has it's. It, there's a fear of missing out. Uh, there's an interest in a new technology. And so what leads us to Bitcoin just as well leads us to altcoins once we've discovered Bitcoin. And we're kind of tired of Bitcoin because it's just like one thing. So that, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's, our ADD gets the better of us. <laughs> uh, the, the, and then the cycle is that you, you come full circle. You know, you get burned on your shit coins. We're allowed to swear, right? Yeah, we can swear. Okay. Barstool sports right. right now. Okay. All right. Well, this this I'll company sw- was built on swearing. Fantastic. And I'm actually not officially uh, uh, associated with Barstool. They're just letting us <laughs> use their studios. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. We we appreciate that. Um, so I I actually I use shitcoin on Twitter, but I think that Twitter censors. Censors Twitter, it. you can't even say "damn" on Twitter without having That's, like to have somebody click a button to see your tweet. It's it's incredible. The and this is this is the home of free speech. <sighs> this is the home of free speech, folks. You can't say "shit coin." Outrageous. It it really it's uh, it's funny to see how Twitter's evolved and what they're deciding yeah. to change. And I don't know. It, it didn't. I mean. There definitely is an argument to be made that there's harass. I mean, there's not. Yeah, there's, there's made. harassment. There is there's harassment abuse, for sure. But for sure, uh, one, going one, as far to like uh, 
to censor yeah. shit coin is, is too far. <laughs> it's such an important word. It is. It is. Again, and the Bitcoin space is filled with memes, yeah. Shitcoin being one of the powerful yeah. memes, I would say. Shitcoin and HODL are two of the po- most powerful. They they are the yin and the yang. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. The yin and the yang of, of Bitcoin memes. Yeah. Stay away from your shitcoins and HODL. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or HODL your shitcoins. You know, some people are really, they are just going to bag hold to the end. Um, but, yeah, so... The 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 Tezos I th- I think was a pretty egregious example uh, both on the scale of how much they raised, uh, and also just on the lack of a product existing. <sighs> that is, that's what I've been writing about it all summer. Is yeah. there there in, it was in Austin, Texas yeah. earlier this summer. It was in July, I believe. There the, the meetup. There was like a like the Bit Devs meetup. It yeah. was for Ethereum. It was like come, come learn how to like spin up an ICO. All you need, like, literally, it was like, we'll teach you how to do it. Right. You need to come with a marketing plan. Yeah. Like, it wasn't even come with a product. It was you come with a, come marketing, with a marketing plan. plan. Like, this is, and this is sort of indicative of our culture right now. People get caught by good marketing all the time. I mean, yeah. and I, that is what's happening right now. And for a, two of us that have been in the space for yeah. five years, this is why I started this podcast is sort of help people avoid these trends and create like a higher base level of knowledge from which so, people can operate. I want to get into that specifically the marketing because um, when when I was in high school nerding out on Austrian economics, that's not the only thing I was nerding out on. <laughs> I, I was also nerding out on Linux, okay. know, open source operating system. So you've got your you've got your Windows that everyone uses. You got your Mac OS that your hipsters and creative types use. Guilty. And then you've got your Linux that your your neck beards that uh, live in, you know, well, they used to live in their parents' basement, but now they are millionaires at a, uh, Amazon or something, you know, like yeah. they've, they've built out their server farm. Um, so uh, Linux is very much, it's it, when you come to open source, it's not polished because they don't have the money or the patience or the interest in marketing. So they don't care about, you know, what we'd call UX, user experience. Like you're in the command line and you're just trying to figure shit out. There's there's no hand holding going on. And the graphics are crap. Like the, the, it's just like low resolution images that they slap together. They're good enough because these are volunteers putting these are volunteer software developers putting together this software and they're what they're interested in is like compilers, <laughs> debugging things, things that you can't like yeah. most people can't even comprehend. You, like you, like so, someone like uh, you freaks have never heard the word kernel before. Okay, <laughs> no. that's what these that's what these developers are into. So they're not into the marketing, and so uh, I, I yeah I would I would spend my time installing Linux on like exotic hardware and uh, being thrilled by that. So when I when I downloaded Bitcoin and opened it up like. Bitcoin's aesthetic is in line with the open source aesthetic of uh, just a completely trash, you know, UI. Like that is um, that the guy Rusty Twit. Who, yeah. What's his it? Rusty Russell. Yeah. Uh, he wrote the Bitcoin Cold Storage Guide that I've been sharing with people. If you guys want to know how to do cold storage of Bitcoin, look up Rusty underscore Twit. Find his GitHub. For yeah. Him, cold Storage Guide. But he, in that guide, basically explains how he came from Linux and compared Bitcoin to Linux. He was like, yeah. Bitcoin is exactly like Linux. It, it is. And for those of you that don't know, that aren't aren't as tech literate as Pierre, um, I'm not even going to say and myself because I'm not <laughs> tech literate at all, but Linux is a very powerful tool yeah, and something yeah. that, like Bitcoin, was open source. When did it start? In the late 80s, early 90s? Oh, yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. Um, and has been sort of built out since. It's a powerful tool that every respected developer well, not every respected developer, well, but for, for, for the most part, you know, it, in most job advertisements for a software development job, they're going to ask for Linux, or you know, they also call it Unix. Which, okay, let's not get into that. But the yeah, that's what they look for. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, make fun of Satoshi's uh, Bitcoin Qt interface that he put together. Um, but yeah, it it has a 
amateur feel to it because he is not a marketing guy. Um, and the white paper is is not a marketing document. It's a technical <laughs> document. Um, so that that to me, when I when I saw this, it screamed to me authenticity. This is the real deal. This isn't someone at a bank or someone at a established tech company, a Google, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, carefully, you know, put together this product to 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 uh, scam us. Uh, no, it is a legitimate grassroots open source piece of software that happens to run a network that is now worth a hundred billion dollars. Officially today. Officially today, uh, and so I would, I would honestly, I would contrast that with Ethereum. Like, if you go onto their website, uh, it feels like a typical, you know, startup marketing landing page, uh, which I, I think um, that's a red flag. And and then you know, okay, Ethereum, but then there's there's worse, right? Like, if these, if you go on these ICO pages. They're clearly targeting people who don't know what Linux is. People who don't know what what it takes. What to, it takes. Like what it takes to make the Bitcoin network run is yeah. a level of of expertise and diligence that I'm pretty sure less than one percent of the people in the world have. Well, I'd say like less than one percent of software developers. Yeah. Um, so even so, point zero 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 one. Yeah. Yeah, one percent of the world is way too many people. Yeah, that's like the world's a big place. It's like what seven hundred million people? <laughs> no, seventy million. Yeah, we'll cut that part out. Marty's Let's cut bad that at part. math. Yeah, mad math, man. Um, yeah, so uh, that that I think that's that the marketing uh, take it seriously. The better the marketing is, the more likely you're getting scammed. This is a heuristic here. We got it's a heuristic a, here. It's a, it's a very important heuristic, and that is. That is something I agree with. Like, and I, I love that you said that you Bitcoin is authentic, and yeah. that in my mind, that is Bitcoin's biggest advantage. That is truly grassroots and did not have to be marketed at all from the beginning. People right. were just drawn to it like a yeah. magnet and started contributing to it, saying, "Hey, this has potential," um, which is sort of a, a perfect segue into what I want to ask you next about the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. Yeah. So this is a great resource for anybody looking to learn about Bitcoin and more importantly, sort of the steps that led to Bitcoin. One of my favorite pages is um, the, it's not mempool. Is it mempool? The no. blog? The, where we go through all the papers is Li- Wei Dai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, literature. Literature. Yep. The literature section of Satoshi Nakamoto Institute is, you got to read it. It's going to take a while. But you got to read through those. These are Bitcoin just didn't just appear out of thin air and no. was was an idea that happened overnight. It, it is an iteration on many technologies that came before it, and a perfect not perfect in any way, but a great combination right. of of sort of technologies that the cipher cypherpunk movement was mm-hmm. was pushing out. So, uh, the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute started as a joke. Um, I, I've heard people say that it is still a joke. I beg who are to... these people? <laughs> uh, well, we've we've uh, we've conveniently listed them on one page. Uh, if you go to the uh, skeptics page, oh, of, you were just uh, <laughs> you just had a nice tweet storm about that. Uh, yes, you know when when we hit a milestone like six thousand dollars, a hundred billion dollar market cap, I cannot restrain myself. I must start trolling on Twitter because. There is a rich, multi-year history of self-important douchebags who thought that they knew, without a doubt in their mind, that Bitcoin is going to fail, uh, and that it was going to zero, and that it was a libertarian fantasy thing, and uh, just you know, completely useless, and uh, and. On top of just, you know, it's fine to have a wrong uh, first opinion of anything. That's fine. But um, when you engage in the dialectic, in in the question and answer, uh, they're they're just very dishonest uh, debaters. And they're, and they're 
terrible debaters too. It's just a yeah. bunch of ma tulips, ma Ponzi schemes. It's like yeah. no, if you actually understand how the technology works, like you, you sound stupid right now. Like yeah. these arguments. There's this dude, Adam Singer. I'm sure. I think you hopped in a mm-hmm. conversation I was having, and I like this dude. I mean, he, he works for Google, I think. Yeah. But he is like, I've got my tweet deck and got it broken into sections. He's on, I think, my tech section, and yeah. without bar once a week, shitting on Bitcoin. It's like, all right, I've engaged him in in debate. Right. Like, all right, have you actually used used Bitcoin before? He's like, oh, I tried to. Try to buy some on Coinbase, but the app wasn't working. It's like, all right, so you've never downloaded a wallet, like, right. created a private key, sent Bitcoin, received Bitcoin, and had that aha moment where, holy shit, like, yeah, I'm exchanging value without. Co- Coinbase can have reliability issues. I'll, I'll give that's them true. that. Oh, I'll yeah, give them that. I'll give them but that. But that's not Bitcoin. It's not. That's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is extremely reliable. Every 10 minutes, the Bitcoin network creates, well, Approximately ten minutes because there's kind of a statistical, you know, on average. On average, over minutes. time, if you look over a seven day, over a seven day period or more, it's going to be around six blocks an hour, like clockwork, or like ten clock. blocks an hour. Excuse me, no, yeah. six blocks an hour. Six blocks an hour. Again, the Marty math. The Marty math is not there. I've had the five math. concussions, people. All right, let's stick with me. Yeah, let's let's give Marty some, uh, yeah, some some slack. Um, so, uh, yeah, so back to Nakamoto Institute. So uh, Austrian economics, right? So it always comes back to this. Um, there's a Ludwig von Mises Institute. So uh, big name, uh, both uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, he, he uh, I don't know, I, 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 I can't speak glowingly enough of everything he's written. Uh, his main book is Human Action. Uh, it's just completely transformed my worldview, and I, I still read it. Like, you know, it, and people people will criticize me for this, but I do read it like it's bedside, like the Bible. Okay, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, you you libertarian Austrian economists are like religious about it. Yeah, I'm not going to deny that. To, to that might be extent. the nerdiest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, <laughs> legitimately have, the nerdiest thing. I've I have heard in my a life. thick. Thousand plus page economics textbook on my nightstand that I, I turn to for solace. Okay, <laughs> folks. I'll Do you have admit. a favorite page? Yeah, I have a favorite page. Actually, uh, it's what determined my major in college, and it's his page about accounting. Really? Yeah. So uh, I, I got my bachelor's and master's in accounting at UT Austin, and his page about explaining how financial accounting helps business people make decisions. Uh, is what determined that I would uh, major in accounting. Uh, in hindsight, should have majored in computer science. Mm-hmm. But you know what? There's just no way to know, right? Like yeah, maybe I wouldn't. I would. I possibly would never have known about Bitcoin if I had not gone into accounting. Because the fact that I got my master's made it such that I met Michael and Daniel at the Mises Circle. So, like, anyway. Oh, uh, it's all. It is all. It's all hindsight. <laughs> it's all hindsight, and I probably wouldn't be here either if I didn't take the certain path that I did. Like mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. just, as a dumb sixteen-year-old, I made a good decision yeah. to take an economics elective my senior year in high school, yeah. um, and my senior year of high school just so happened to be the fall of two thousand eight. Uh, when the world was going to shit, and I was yeah. in this economics class, like yeah. learning about what was going on, had a very adept teacher who was was willing to dive in and sort of telling us what was going on with the situation. We read the tarp, we read parts of the tarp b- yeah. bill, and at that moment, I was a seventeen year old sitting sitting in a desk in North Philly. I was like, "Holy shit! I got to figure out like how how all of this works." Right. And going to college, I'm an econ major. Uh, and I discovered Bitcoin while writing a paper on monetary policy and hmm. stumbled upon the white paper. Didn't didn't get sucked into the rabbit hole at first. I don't think that anyone gets sucked in on the first exposure. Yeah, no. It takes a couple. Few. I definitely did. I think I saw it, and then six months later, I saw like a news article, yeah. and then dove in. There you go. Like probably the spring of 2013 is when I decided yeah. to put my snorkel on and dive down Fantastic. the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it is. It's and that's what's fascinating about the space is that once you're, and this is what Bailey was saying on the mm-hmm. Chris the Rose show as well. Like once you're in here, like it's it's hard. You don't. Like there's you, no getting out. There's no getting out because it is, 
and this is something I like to really like to get into when you talk about Bitcoin. We're talking about a technology that comes around once every 500 years, which I would argue oh, is... Oh, you know what? I'm going to say this is a technology that is coming around once in the history of humanity. Oh. I really... I, that's There's going to be before Bitcoin and then after Bitcoin. I've, I've heard that before. We're going to start basing our calendar off the Genesis block soon. That's an entirely reasonable thing to do. Now, let's not diminish the contributions of Jesus Christ to our society, but uh, it is, I think that what, it's not, it's not like the printing press. It, it's not, it's not even like the internet because fundamentally money is one half of every transaction, every financial transaction that goes on, you know, like, uh, you know, you're, you're buying something at Target, one half of it is money. Uh, and it. That fact grants, and the fact that money is printed by governments, grants governments a tremendous amount of power over the economy, over our lives. And when that power gets taken away uh, in 10, 20 years, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we can discuss that. But uh, that will be epoch changing. That's going to change the course of humanity and because I truly do think that markets make better decisions than governments. I do as well. I do as well. Uh, we talked about it last week. We uh, were talking about when Chicago <clears throat> uh, bid for the Olympics back in 2013, mm. whenever it was. They sold the rights to their parking tickets. Oh, boy. Um, to a to a private entity, yeah, because they had never been profitable. Sold okay. it for like a billion dollars. Fair the private entity was like profitable in eighteen months, and the city will never see any of those revenues. Yeah, but you guys have heard that story already. We're not going to repeat it. But this <laughs> is an example of, of... Yeah. government incompetence. <laughs> exactly, and it's um, it's rampant. Um, let's let's circle back to uh, the Nakamoto Institute because I was saying like you know Ludwig von Mises wrote this book Human Action. I love it. So there's this institute named after him, and we were like, well. You know, it'd be funny if there was a Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. And I, I, I will. I think if if my ser- if my memory serves me right, I think those words came out of Michael Goldstein's mouth, also known Bitstein. Follow him at Bitstein on Twitter. Uh, at Bitstein, I, he'll yell at you and tell you to eat steak. I, I yeah, <laughs> I, I noticed that um, there's quite a few people on Twitter that are not following Michael Goldstein. Really? Yeah, because you go on some of these Twitter accounts, they've got like millions of followers, and Michael only has thousands. So clearly, <laughs> there are a number of people on Twitter, and I don't want to point fingers. I'm sure that our audience is following Michael Goldstein, and if you're not, go ahead and get on Twitter and Better fix that. Better hop on it. Uh, but clearly, there's a demographic out there that's missing out on his constant stream of carnivory and Bitcoin wisdom. It's a uh, it's egregious. Carnivory. I'm not. We're not going to dive too deep let's, into carnivory, <laughs> but just so you guys, if you guys don't know out there, there is a, another segment of Bitcoin users that only eat meat, like a bunch of freak fucks. I <laughs> I, I cannot do it. I think. Yeah. I think it was. This is actually funny because, yeah. uh, I I. I was like watching you guys post all these these steak pictures. Like, yeah. just eat a steak, eat a goddamn steak. Goddamn I started steak. eating more steak, yeah. but I wasn't like changing my diet in any other mm-hmm. way. So I was just getting like unhealthier and unhealthier as I continued to eat bread and other shit with the steak. Uh, I okay, you know, I would argue that just adding more steak is going to make you healthier. I'll take Even it. Even if you don't change any of the parts of the equation, tell that to my wife. I will tell that to your wife. She, she had a, she had a steak intervention with me. Oh wow! So you've been eating too much steak lately. I've I've had one of those with my mother-in-law. <laughs> really? Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> All right. We're about to we're about to fall down a carnivore. We're so far off the rails right now. Uh, anyway, Michael Goldstein was like, "Hey, it'd be funny if we had a Satoshi Nakamoto Institute." We looked at each other. Let's do it. We're doing it. We're st- so we, you know we got the URL and then we started uh, yeah th- throwing up everything that Satoshi Nakamoto has ever written. That's our goal. Get everything on there. And I can't stress how great of a resource that is because yeah. you watch the idea evolve over time. Yeah. And you come to realize that Satoshi is like a fallible person. He's mm-hmm. he's somebody working with people. Uh, it's very well known now that he was not the best developer. He was not the best engineer. Uh, he needed help. Mm-hmm. And 
sort of seeing the creator, the creator. Uh, it's like, it's, it's all like, it's, Oh, it's so religious. I, There's it no is. going around it. You know what? Yeah. I argue, embrace it. Yeah, I, I, embrace I do embrace it to the, a certain extent. Yes. It is. And Lewis and I touched on this in the first episode. Like he, like, he, she, it, they, or them. Like it could be. Yeah. Oh it, yeah. It, like you can go on and uh, on a days for it, Satoshi it, it theories, could but be, uh, yeah, a spontaneous manifestation of the internet uh, becoming self-conscious, self-aware, and uh, manifesting itself as Satoshi. We haven't ruled that out. We have what, not. We've ruled one person out. <laughs> we know beyond any reasonable doubt. Craig Wright is not Satoshi. Fuck off. He's a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. He's not a fraud. <laughs> no, he is. He is a fraud. So for those of you who don't know, this guy Craig White's Wright, some Australian dude, he claimed to be Satoshi. He got to Wired, I believe, and he got to Gavin and Dressen, who was at one point the... Lead scientist. Lead the scientist. Uh, ma- maintainer of Bitcoin. Of Bitcoin Core, but he basically duped Gavin into believing yeah. that he was Satoshi and it later came out pretty it's pretty evident that he faked the evidence right right, right. faked the private key yeah. um and has since i think he's openly admitted that he's not Satoshi now so you know uh, i i was reading an article about this very issue of no he has not admitted and he is he is very evasive and refuses to answer the question. And uh, basically, I mean, he just plays off the ambiguity. And, uh, yeah, he's just a, a, a two-cent scammer. Um, and so, yeah, so the Satoshi Nakamoto's too. And I we had written I – had, I had written um, – no, that's not true. I had not written about Bitcoin uh, before. Uh, but I realized uh, – we realized, hey, let's put a blog on this website – Let's put our thoughts on there. And I went into why I instantly knew that Bitcoin was the macroeconomic phenomena of humanity. Humanity, the history of humanity. Uh, And so I, I put pen to paper. Uh, figuratively, you know, it's 21st century, uh, and uh, wrote up a, a series of blog posts. Uh, s- some of the specific sentences in there I probably wouldn't stand by today, but uh, as a whole, as a body of work, I think that it perfectly encapsulates my thoughts on Bitcoin. And that's that my, my focus really is on Bitcoin as a currency, as an asset, and what does it mean to be a good money what does it mean to be a sound money? And that's what I'm interested in. Uh, I think that I've resolved that, and like I, I don't really, uh, you know, have anything more to explore there, which is why I haven't written in years. Uh, I'm just waiting for shit to go down uh, and for me to be vindicated. Uh, <laughs> my my last blog post was about what's called speculative attacks. I can get into mm-hmm. explaining, and that is the paper I meant to mention on. In the beginning of the podcast, yeah. you mentioned hyper Bitcoinization at the end of speculative attacks. Yes. Um, so, uh, hyper Bitcoinization was a term uh, invented by Daniel Krewis, uh to describe what it's like when. So, there's a phenomenon called dollarization. You go to South America, you you go to Cuba. You know, you're you're on your coke run. You know, you're you're buying your coke in Cuba, whoring around, and you're spending dollars, U.S. dollars. Uh, and the way that works is that in some of these South American countries, they don't have a local currency. They only use U.S. dollars. Yeah. Uh, I've been to Costa Rica many times. Like Down there, you can use colones or, or American dollars. Mm. If you want to hit up Playa Hermosa, do a little surfing. There we go. Accept either one. And actually, yeah, I think there's a few places that accept Bitcoin down there. Beautiful. So the more places accept dollars, at some point... The whole economy is just dollars, and we call that dollarization. And that happens because your local currency goes to shit because your government is run by incompetent, you know, fuckheads. So uh, at some point, the local currency is completely trashed. No one cares about it. You could say that was hyperinflation, like it got hyperinflated away, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't even... That doesn't even happen because people don't have the patience for that. They just go to dollars because 
dollars are more reliable than your local currency, which it's crazy to believe as an American, but that's that's the case. <laughs> it is uh, crazy to believe, and it's crazy yeah. to believe as somebody who worked worked uh, at a futures fund, and yeah. my job was to write commentaries. And basically, if you guys don't know what futures funds are, it's you're buying futures contracts on any type of asset, a commodity, fixed interest or fixed income, excuse me, currencies, yeah. uh, gold, precious metals, stuff like that, grains, coffee. And part of my job was being a central bank hawk, basically following their their policy meetings, mm. their announcements, and announcement after announcement, meeting after meeting. They were setting targets, not hitting them, setting projections, yeah. not hitting them. Boy, it, I wish I could do that at work, you know? It, it, set, set some targets and not meet them and not get exactly. fired. Uh, it's exactly. It's a cushy gig. It's a cushy gig. It is a cushy gig because uh, they're omnipotent. They can never yeah. be wrong. Um, yeah. They know what they're doing. Trust them. Trust um, them. And that's and that for me and that and and very similar to your story. That's how I got into Bitcoin. Yeah. I was from a mon- monetary as or yeah, a currency uh, yeah, financial, and yeah. from a financial aspect. And it is the polar opposite of what we're doing right now. It, it, the The schedule is set in stone. Yes, it it's just happening every ten minutes. You don't have to predict anything. You can predict the schedule and the release of bitcoins. Yeah very easily um and it is anathema to the system that we have now which is sort of throw something at the wall and hope that we hit the targets that we set out you know um so bitcoin bitcoin's monetary policy is uh best described as a money supply targeting so we're targeting a specific number of bitcoins a specific number of bitcoins get created on average every 10 minutes and the total supply at the end of the day, is going to be 21 million. Now, we can get into technicals because it's going to be a little less than that, but hey, that's just, you know, cherry on the cake. Um, and uh, so, hyper, hyper-Bitcoinization. hyper uh, You've got dollarization, which is great and all, but the thing with dollarization is that when a country dollarizes, so it creates more demand for dollars, right? And so, it causes the dollar to appreciate. But... A, these countries are relatively small compared to the U.S. economy, so you wouldn't really see any effect anyway. And B, the Fed is just going to print more money to meet that demand, and so you just net out to zero, right? Like it mm-hmm. doesn't. A dollarization does not affect the price of dollars or you know, the exchange rate of dollars uh, at the end of the day. However, with Bitcoin's monetary policy, where we are targeting a specific money supply, we're not going to create more if more people start adopting Bitcoin. Uh, and so that means that when we Bitcoinize, the value of Bitcoins goes up and, in fact, kind of skyrockets as we're seeing today. Today. And actually, this is a great point. I have this written down to speak with you about uh, mm. Tom Lee. He's from Fundstrat here in New York. He Okay. He's, he's been on TV a few times the last couple months. Oh, he's yes. Been really I like good. this guy. Yeah. Yes. He's been really good. So he gave his case for $25,000 Bitcoin in Hell the yeah. next five years. Mm-hmm. And very this, conservative. Very conservative. Very <laughs> conservative in my mind. Um, but he was basically explaining the, the liquidity glut that you get into because of hodlers, because of yeah. people that hold. And every, every 210,000 blocks, less Bitcoin are being created. So what we're going to see is... It hits a certain point of popularity, and enough people are holding. Yeah, there's going to be uh, a vertical line, right? So um, I'd push back on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, basically, when you think about every Bitcoin that is out there on the market today, each one is owned by someone who acquired it at a certain price. So they've got their cost basis. Some of them it might be zero. You know, they got it in 2009. They mined it, whatever. Uh, so their cost basis is zero. Uh, others, their cost basis as of today is six thousand dollars. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so when you kind of think of that spectrum, right? And then there's everyone in between. So that's the that's that's on one side of the equation. You've got people's cost basis. What price did they get in at? On the other side of the equation, you've got what price do they get out at? In their heads, what price do they have where they will voluntarily separate themselves from their Bitcoins? I know it's a crazy concept. I would never do it. (laughs) But some people have a price in mind that if it gets to $6,000, i am selling. If it gets to $10,000, i am selling. 
X amount. You know, they might mm-hmm. not sell their whole stash, but they're going to sell a percentage of it. Um, because they want to go buy their Lambo. They need to go to Las Vegas. Don't spend your Bitcoin on a Lambo, people. They Lambos need to are cheesy. throw dollar bills at strippers. Whatever their interests are, you know, good or bad. Or, frankly, like, they they want to start a R&D lab and pay people to work on Bitcoin. You know, there's there's hodlers who are into that, too. That's what hap- Is chain code uh, funded by a uh, hodler or... Because I just saw they gave a grant to Peter Todd, which I was excited to see. Yeah. Um, so uh, I I can kind of speak to Chain Code, but um, basically uh, the the founders of Chain Code uh, ran a started a high frequency trading shop here in New York City, and um, then retired from that and started Chain Code. So they were independently wealthy mm-hmm. from starting an unrelated business uh, unrelated to Bitcoin. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, so the, again the equation, right? So we got to look at what people's exit prices are, and I think that because there's a wide variety of exit prices, I layer on top of that. So I'm talking about like purely rational level, you mm-hmm. know, like layer on top of that the the emotions, the animal <sighs> spirits when you're up four hundred percent, when you're down eighty percent, boy. That changes the way you calculate in your mind. We are full of cognitive biases. Yeah, that's true. I'm actually sort of happy. I bought my first Bitcoin catching knives after Mount Gox went down. I bought my first Bitcoin at eight hundred dollars. Folks, buy the dip. Catch but those knives. I, I caught one, but I rode that all the way down like a buck eighty. Yeah, and I think that hardened me. I think it hardened me as a person, as an investor. Yeah, I literally didn't know it was six thousand until I hopped on Twitter today and saw people tweeting about it. Like yeah. I, I don't check the price anymore. There's a quote. In what Nassim Taleb book is it? I believe it's um, I believe it's fooled by randomness, where yeah. he says he he giggles every time he sees somebody on a subway ch- checking their portfolio, like in live feed. Like if you're going to invest in this, enter with a long term mindset and yeah. put your money in and forget about it. That's what I. That's where I'm at right now as a Bitcoin hodler. I I'm not as advanced as that. I th- Nassim Talib would be laughing at me on the subway. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, I created a Twitter bot that tweets out the price every 10 minutes so that while I'm trolling on Twitter, I can also keep up on the price. That's how <laughs> much of a degenerate I am. Just, But, um, I can- no, I, 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 you know, I, I don't look at the price like, should I sell, should I buy? You know, mm. I look at the price, it's like, where are we in this massive disruption? It's basically like a confidence index. It's a confidence index and it's it's just it's it's a vanity metric. It's a it's it's something that uh you know, when it's up, I'm happy, when it's down, I'm buying. Uh, <laughs> and no matter what, at the end of the day, one bitcoin equals one bitcoin. One bitcoin equals one bitcoin. So, that there you know what? That's good Marty math. That is that is Probably the only Marty math you'll see that's executed perfectly tonight. Perfectly executed. I'll probably try two or more problems and beautifully equation. I might mess them up as well. Yeah, so I don't think the price is going to go vertically up. I think that we are. We obviously we're in a bull market right now. Uh, I think that the, this bull market is not done oh, yet. I wasn't saying the the price is going to go no, vertical I, door in this bull market, but I'm saying when hyper Bitcoinization happens, yeah. there's going to be a certain lockstep sort of okay, jump so evaluation. Let's let's yeah, let's get into what's what that's going to be about. So, um, yeah. So I like let's say let's say let's say hypothetical. Uh, you know, we go up to twelve thousand in the next six months. It crashes back down to 2000, and then, you know, like it's it's like uh, 2013 all over again. I, we had like two bubbles back to back. Yeah. Uh, so let's say you know next year we get another bubble, we get it's like 40,000 or something crazy like that. It's not crazy, folks. We're going much higher than that. Uh, and so basically, this gets into uh, speculative attacks, which is that at some point. Someone starts borrowing money to buy bitcoins, and you'll see you'll see like little news stories about someone who like took out a home equity loan to buy bitcoins. You know, ooh, what a crazy, what a crazy gambler, crazy gambler over here. The one dude, where was it? Um, I think he might have been in the Netherlands, sold all of his belongings mm. for Bitcoin. You better yeah. have you, you better have your your private keys like secured like in a oh, vault. Man. You better yeah. you, should, you might have. 
you might want to dig a hole somewhere in the woods and hide those private keys in there. Yeah, yeah. And to be clear, I'm not giving investment advice. In fact, uh, this you know, is in no way investment d- advice. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I would argue do not invest more than two percent of your net worth in Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> don't well. Let's go through. Let's go through it right now. Don't invest more than you're willing to lose. And yes. do please do your fucking research before your you put research. your money into this. I, I like I said, I bought catching knives. Yeah. At the end of 2013, I did a heavy like six months of research before I yeah. before I dipped my toes. Um, this is something because you're just doing yourself a disservice at the end because you have these outlandish expectations of what's going to happen. I'll, I'll admit, when I first bought, yeah. I got the get rich quick bug. I was like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, yeah I just bought Bitcoin, I'm gonna be rich." Like it's like that, but it's, and you'll find in time, like like we said, you go through this cycle hmm. where you realize this is sort of a new thing for humanity, for yeah. for our species, and it's gonna take people time. And we're we're gonna get rich at a reasonable pace, which. It's fine. It is, and, yeah. And, and you're gonna have periods where you get poor. You get super poor because the price goes down eighty percent. Everyone's bearish. Um, but yeah, so and pe- yeah, go ahead. To get into the next crash, which I wanted to touch on as well. Yeah. I think I have a theory of what it's gonna be. Okay. You probably won't be happy with me. A lot of people don't like this guy on Twitter, but I agree with Bitfinex. Oh I, yeah. I, I don't like the tether situation. Um, I I don't have. T- explain the tether situation. So from what I understand, Bitfinex, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a huge Bitcoin exchange based out of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. It was hacked. When was it hacked? About this time last year, right? Yeah, Around this time last year, it was hacked. 119,000 Bitcoin? Huge amount. Yeah. Yeah, A lot of Bitcoin. People thought they were done. People thought they were done. Um, And they basically came back and created Tether, which... The way I understand it, I, I'm not going to say it's, I completely it's understand. It's a peg to the dollar. It's a peg to, yeah, yeah, it's a one to one dollar peg, right. and they have apparently they have these dollars. Hey, folks, uh, if you're going to Google pegging, uh, go ahead and do that at home. It's you may get not safe for work results. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, with that little disclaimer, yeah, tethers. Do, yeah, you. you you're you're gonna get blocked at work, and you're gonna be in the HR office next week. Yeah, and it's gonna be an uncomfortable conversation because, <laughs> yeah, just go ahead and Google pegging, but like do it at home in a private what browser. What is pegging? Am I gonna have to Google it here? Should I explain it? I don't, we it's pretty cut, bad. We can cut it out if it's bad. It's pretty bad. So, uh, you know, you got your your, uh, your 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 girlfriend. We'll cut it out. Just tell me what it is. All right, you got your girlfriend. She's got a strap on. <laughs> All right, I see where this is going. Okay, you're getting pegged. Oh, oh, I knew, <laughs> I knew a girl that did some pegging in college. It was oh really, boy, yeah. Oh boy, she had some stories. Oh boy, um, let's get it back on the rails here, folks. You we're, know what? Says what? We're not, we're not, we're not a uh, hash power, or whatever that other. We're not uh, getting very oh, respectable. We're not. <laughs> I. This is Gonzo journalism of, it, of it Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. If you're into pegging, cool. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> just don't Google about it at work. Just don't Google it at work. I'm sure if you're into it, you're not doing that. But if you are curious about it, don't Google it at work. There might be a correlation between the two kinds of the sexual and the non-sexual pegging. I, f- I think, personally, So what that this related. conversation started out with is what I think is going to be the cause of the next Bitcoin crash. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't think. I don't know. I think it could. I speculate it yeah, could be. Yeah, okay. It's a theory. So the theory is, um, so again, Bitfinex hacked for 119,000 Bitcoin around this time last year. They shut down operations for a couple weeks. People were very freaked out about what was going to happen. Yeah. And they basically came out and said, we're going to wholesale, like cover the loss. We're going to eat it. And at the same time, they got their banking taken away. So they, 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 they have no way of sort of similar to what's happening to medical marijuana right. companies here in the States. They, these banks won't do business with Bitfinex. But Tether, apparently, there's one bank in Taiwan that will do business with them and is they have hmm. an equal amount of dollars stashed away in this bank in Taiwan that's hmm. tied up to Tether. Which So it's pegged to those dollars in that account. Right. From what I, that's the way I understand it. Gotcha. But, Again, I don't completely understand. I'm a man of of, of intuition and gut yeah, feelings, and that, my gut feeling yeah. is that this is a lot like Gox, mm. similar to that feeling of 
of Roger Ver coming out and saying Mount, Go- Mount Gox is is so, liquid. Uh, th- then yeah. that's sort of the vibe I'm getting with Bitfinex. Because apparently you can't withdraw U.S. dollars from Bitfinex. You can't withdraw Bitcoin, which is good. But and and, and let yeah. me be clear, this is not going to hurt Bitcoin. Well, I actually wanted to get back to that. So basically, like my view is that every every bubble we've gone through, on the way up, we have like memes and narratives. So mm-hmm. like if you'll remember, like the bubble that went to two seventy in two thousand thirteen, mm-hmm. the meme there was Cyprus. Oh yep, yep. Right. Cyprus went okay, but like if you if you went to Cyprus, you'd know that there's there's no Bitcoin going on yeah. there. Like so, for just, those of you who don't know, Cyprus what was that 2012, yeah, there was 2011. Like a, they had to run on the banks in Cyprus. Uh, they had a haircut on the bank. So if you yeah. had a hundred grand in the bank, you got back ninety grand. Yeah, bum deal. Um, sort of like negative interest rates, just more overt. Yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty bad. So they call it a bail in. Bail in. <laughs> um, and this and yeah. Going back to economics and being very aware of of language, bailing that's some Orwellian Orwellian mm. doublespeak right there, in my opinion. For sure, for um, sure. So you're, the ba- the connotation of bailing is you're going to help you're going to help out everybody, but at the end of the day, you're just helping out bad decisions or condoning bad decisions. That's would, that's exactly right. I yeah. would argue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's there's always a meme and narrative, uh, on, both on the way up. So like when we went to 1200, it was all about China, uh, you know, capital controls. Mm-hmm. And then uh, during the crash, there's also a narrative about why the crash is happening. Um, but I think that fundamentally, we have a run up because people are momentum traders, mm-hmm. and at some point, they run out of money. And then you've got more sellers and buyers, and it crashes. Okay. Like I, to me, that's that's what the bubble is. But we've got like things floating around in the news that we want to bring in to say, "Hey, this is the explanation." But really, it's it's. I, I think it's really simple. It's that people start seeing the price drifting up, and they start buying in because the thing, the price is going to continue going up, and it's kind of a virtuous cycle until we run out of new buyers. Mm-hmm. And then we have a crash, uh, and then it starts all over again. Or uh, that's, I think, what's going to happen. So, and this is what we can get into the future from yeah. here. Like, so that's what I was just. How long is this going to go on? Do you think these booms and busts? Like, yeah. is it going to go on forever, or mm. do we do boom and bust till hyper Bitcoinization? Then we get to a certain point where that's, yeah, it that's... becomes a medium of exchange as well, instead yeah. of a store value. So, well, it... I I think that. We reach uh, an event horizon, you know, mm-hmm. folks. Let's go back to our physics class. Physics class uh, with black holes. Okay, again, this is not a sexual term. This is like we're talking about astronomical astronomical uh, phenomena, uh, and the event horizon uh, is when you're going to get sucked into the black hole, and there's no going back. As soon as light. Touches the event horizon, there's no getting out. Boom, gone, black hole. So uh, that event horizon, I'm calling hyper Bitcoinization, and I think that uh, we probably have a few more bubbles before we reach the event horizon. Um, I could be completely wrong. I th- we could be on the cusp of it, and tomorrow, like you know, Bitcoin goes to the moon. But uh, I think that basically we go through a few more of these bubbles, and at some point. And this goes back to people borrowing money to buy bitcoins. And so here's here's the here's the insidious here's the uh, kind of why speculative attacks are a thing, is that when people borrow dollars, when they borrow euros, when they borrow any kind of fiat currency that's coming out of this fractional reserve banking system that I've been describing, the fractional reserve banking system creates new money to lend out. And when it doesn't have the ability to do so, the bank, central bank comes in and helps them do it, right? So, and so usually this money goes into bonds. You know, that's mm-hmm. why we got bonds yeah. that are yielding two percent. So the the Fed will go to the banks and say, hey, "Is this how it ha- happens?" The Fed will go to the banks and say, "Hey, why don't you print up a couple Treasury bonds and we'll buy them off of you for cash?" Uh, Is- well, uh, so let's uh, the mechanics of it are the U.S. government runs a massive deficit, right? Mm-hmm. We've got a huge spending problem. We can't cut anything. Our political leadership is incompetent, etc. So uh, the Treasury Department issues bonds. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Fed 
sh- you know, they they they're not buying them directly from the treasury, but you know, so these banks buy them from the treasury, and then the Fed buys them from these banks. Yeah, that's that was QE. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about like commercial lending or residential lending, you know, the banks go out and they they cr- create money, uh, and um, they have a certain amount of reserves that they're required to hold at the Fed, but uh, that th- they have ample reserves um, because of the Fed, you know, essentially uh, helping bailing them out during the financial crisis. Um, but so when and here's the, here's the thing too, money is fungible. So if you're a small business owner and you have uh, assets in your business that you can borrow against from a commercial bank, uh, you can borrow that money. And then you take the money out of your business, and then you go and buy bitcoins, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you have a house and it, you have paid off the mortgage, you can go get a new mortgage. You take the proceeds, you invest in bitcoins. So when that happens, by you, the way, by the way, Pierre is not advising you to do this no, right now. This is, is this he, is an explanation of an economic phenomena called mm-hmm. a speculative attack. Yes. So uh, I'm not suggesting that you do this. It's purely hypothetical, uh, but. Hypothetically, you could make a lot of money doing this. Uh, and uh, so new money, new dollars, specifically, new U.S. dollars are created when someone goes and borrows from a bank. And that actually causes the value of dollars to go down. And then the fact that you're taking those dollars and buying Bitcoins causes the value of Bitcoins to go up. And then what do you do? You can sell a portion of your Bitcoins, pay off your loan, and boom. And boom, you're done. And that's been my investment thesis since the beginning. We're going to see a great rotation sort of from fiat currencies, not completely at first, but yeah. eventually over time, over hundreds of years, but a rotation from these fickle currencies to, to a better monetary system, which is so, Bitcoin. I, I see it happening in like decades. Decades? Yeah. And we're going to stop it there for today, ending on hyper-Bitcoinization. I'm sure all of you want to be hearing more, but for the sake of time, I know it's very hard for people to listen to three-hour podcasts. We're going to cut it here. So make sure uh, between episodes you go on Twitter and follow Pierre at Pierre underscore Rochard. Uh, That's P-I-E-R-R-E underscore Rochard, R-O-C-H-A-R-D. And look him up uh Look up the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute when you get a chance to start reading through those papers. Uh, There's a wealth of knowledge, and I can't stress how important it is to to understand uh, sort of the technologies that came before Bitcoin and sort of the ethos around the economic theory uh, that that Bitcoin sort of rose out of. So uh, if you guys like this episode, uh, please subscribe, review, give us five stars, tell your friends. Tell anybody that's uh, been S or talking about Bitcoin to check us out. Um, and we'll be back tomorrow. I think I'm going to post the second part of the interview tomorrow. So if you're hurting for more, you don't have to wait too long. Uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Peace and love.